This podcast is brought to you by Nut Money Coalition's Farm Talk Podcast. They have been serving the Hopi community since 2004 by working to reaffirm and preserve traditional Hopi farming. Go to nutmoneycoalition.org to learn more. That's N-A-T-W-A-N-I coalition.org. Native Community Capital is your trusted partner for home loans or financing your business. Visit us at nativecap.org or call us at 855-628-2272. Let's work together to rebuild tribal economies. are now listening to the Carl and J-Man Save the World podcast. I am your host, the five star, five diamond chef, J-Man. And back with me is Carl. <laughs> hey, I, I had a clever I, nickname for you, but oh. then I, in the last minute, it disappeared out of my head. Oh, so. r- oh, really? You weren't that clever enough to bring me back <laughs> on here. So, you know, J-Man was very, very sad that I left and he cried to me and he was ugly crying right now. And uh, he's still wiping his tears away with joy that I'm back here in the studio with him. Uh, J-Man, quit touching my leg. I cried so hard that the Five Star Podcast had one of the best performances in the first 24 hours out of any of our episodes. And so I'd like to thank you all for showing me some love and showing me support. And, you know, Carl kind of was on his knees begging me to come back because, you know, <laughs> you, you all heard what his solo episode was like. And so he wanted to be back at the cool kids table. He wanted to be uh, popular again. And, and so, but you're welcome, Carl. I, I, I begrudgingly came back. So yeah, history tells differently. So right now. (laughs) But anyway, we are back in the studio with you all. Thank you for listening to our self episodes. I know you kind of probably got our solo episodes. It was probably, you know, I, I had a very, I I had a very hard time doing that because of the way I had nothing to talk about. I had really nothing to talk about. And yes, I did get up at six o'clock in the morning to do that episode. I wanted it to be a uh, like a morning show. So I wanted to have that feeling of uh, getting up that time. And I never knew that the sun doesn't come up at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, so I had to, I, it was a whole new experience for me. It was an interesting experience. And like I said, in, in my solo episode that thank you all for giving us the opportunity to be able to do that. Cause can you imagine if we did those solo episodes before, before we started the CJ podcast, we'd probably be talking to like two people. Yeah, that's probably true. So, you know, with all you guys and all of your contributions, you know, keeping us together is one thing, but yeah, like what J man said in his solo episode is that, yeah, we do kind of get tired with each other and yes it is kind of like a marriage in that way the Hopi marriage that uh you know a Hopi guy wants to go for a younger model and uh so he dumps his wife and then goes to another one so oh you listened to my episode that, that, that's I, I so did sweet. I did I just listened for my name that's pretty much it <laughs> <laughs> but but we're back. Like I said, peanut butter and jelly is back because I, I think that a lot of you all express that you prefer us together as opposed to uh, solo. But, you know, we're back with a new episode. And I, I actually, you know what, there, there's one thing that I completely spaced out and I forgot to do. And I sincerely apologize. All right. That I do owe some shout outs. Okay. I owe some shout outs because there's a local nonprofit out here that hosts something called the Heath Alumni Challenge 2021. And basically, you know, it's all the whole piece and, you know, whatever, whatever university they graduated from their alma mater and they kind of rally and try to get other people that graduate from their university to try to fundraise and raise the most money, um, through their alumni groups for the benefit of Hopi college students. And so, you know, as you all know that I am a graduate of Arizona State University, I am a Sun Devil for life. And so I joined in with Team ASU and I uh, solicited through our Instagram to try to get some donations from the listeners. And some of the listeners did step up to the challenge and I do owe you all some shout outs. So I'd like to give a special shout out to my buddy, uh, Dion Sania. And, you know, he's actually an alum of, uh, 
a, a different school. So he completely <laughs> turned his back on, on the school that he actually goes to. But, you know, he came out and showed some love to Team ASU. So definitely a big shout out to you. And then another shout out to you to another listener that I know listens to the podcast pretty consistently and is also an alumni of Arizona State University. So I'd like to give a big shout out to Jamie Dallas, who was also instrumental in helping us win, helping Team ASU win. And so, you know, I, I uh, big apologies to the rest of the universities out there, but not everybody can be five stars like uh, ASU. So, all right. Well, you know, your um, shout out to the uh, school that I have never heard of before, ASU. So uh, <laughs> I don't think that school exists anymore. Is that is that one of those refrigeration schools that it's, doesn't exist? Um, you might find it in like Forbes magazine. I know you don't read literature like that. <laughs> it's listed under the listings of the number one school in, in innovation. And so, you know, it's pretty, pretty oh, really? big deal. Yeah. I have never heard of ASU before. I have heard of NAU. I, I wouldn't expect. Is that a, is that a sister school of NAU? I, I wouldn't expect ASU to be in uh, Mad Magazine or uh, <laughs> in, a, in heavy jug, metal. Jug, in, jughead books. So. <laughs> in heavy metal books. <laughs> I know your literature is very limited. So, <laughs> But anyway, yeah, congratulations to all the people that have donated for student scholarships because out here on the reservation, yeah, like schooling is one of the top priorities that we we want to have. But on the other hand, is that we want to contain our traditions and our cultural values along with that. So I congratulate everybody who is going to school and who is in that or to pursue, to pursue a higher education. For sure. And so thank you all. And, and for anybody else that donated to any of the alumni groups out there, we definitely appreciate that. But we're back. And so I, I guess after two weeks of being on our own, like most reservation relationship breakups, we couldn't wait to run back to each other. Yeah, and exactly. So, you know, like uh, there was that meme that says uh, that one girl, one girl beats up her, uh, her, her uh, boyfriend and calls the cop and said that I'll, I'll wait for you afterwards. So. <laughs> And, and if I can look past Carl and his support of a domestic violence that we do have a topic for today. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we have um, a huge topic because and, a special guest. and we do have a special guest. So get ready for that. I mean, the, the topic right now is I believe is women's lead. Women's lead. And so, you know, this is actually a topic that you chose. I normally am against you giving any contribution to the topics that we talk about, but you know, <laughs> apparently that the rest of the staff members here on the podcast thought it'd be a worthwhile topic to talk about. And so, you know, we we'll talk about women's lead. Yeah. I mean, and I wanted to do this because, uh, I, I believe that because this is a matrilineal society is that there has not been a real formal way of presenting like women in higher power here on the Hopi reservation. I mean, you have like the councilship, you have the tribal leadership here, but they're all consistent of men pretty much. And even in our our laws of, of choosing the vice president or vice chairman or chairman states that he, meaning that he is the only one pronoun, that a male can only run for vice chairman or chairman. And, and so I guess in a way, this is kind of like a part two to our uh, Matt... Bless, bless the matriarchy episode. And so I really hope that Carl keeps it cool this time and, you know, doesn't start running off about traditional regalia in the <laughs> educational setting. And so I remind you, Carl, please stick to topic. You know, the, the reason why I said that was because <laughs> that ho Bahana school should stay Bahana and Hopi should stay Hopi. <laughs> I know you just did that to annoy me, but I mean, you, I, I guess really, you know, because in, in that first episode that where we strongly talked about women in leadership positions that we did talk about, I guess, the cultural perspective yeah. and of women and where their place is. But of course, now we're living in a different day and age. We're living in the 2021s and there's a lot of folks out there that have upgraded their factory settings and downloaded some modern apps and, and see, uh, I guess, um, women in different places than they traditionally do now. Because as you heard from our matrilineal society, that the Res Famous Wife makes me get my own goddamn salt now. And so, you know, <laughs> it, it, it's women are, 
are moving and they're progressing in uh, in, in different directions. And I guess one of the things that I kind of wanted to share, and I think this was uh, something that you kind of wanted to discuss too as well, is, is what, what is our perspective of women in leadership? Carl and J-Man's perspective, because I think that, you know, when you go on social media, that you hear this narrative of this great disparity of women not being able to be in leadership positions or you hear this big narrative of women and the huge pay disparities yeah. in terms of the yeah. types of salaries that women are receiving versus the types of salaries that men are receiving. And, you know, I've always thought about this in this way, because then I, I think that when you think about like national data, right? Yeah. That, and I think that that's largely what those narratives are based upon is the national data, that the national data isn't really reflective of reservations. Yeah. That the national data kind of in a lot of ways sometimes is opposite of what the realities of reservations are because then you know when we were talking about when we talked about when we had that first episode and where we were talking about women and their place especially here on the reservation if i was just to go based off of my own experience and thinking about my own life all the different jobs that i've worked throughout my life i would say that a majority of the supervisors i've had were women yeah yeah that is true and so, you know, if that's my experience that a lot of women are in leadership right now, then I guess, you know, what's the problem? And I, I, I don't say I don't mean to say that in a, in a jackass <laughs> way, but, you know, just based upon my own experience, yeah, that's what I yeah. would think. You know, yeah, like like what I, what J Man is saying is that yeah, a lot of women here on the reservation hold managerial positions in the different programs, and it's I guess it's because of the way that men perceive that as like a second rate to whatever they're doing, pretty much second rate to sitting around carving kachina dolls. Yeah, I guess so. I guess I guess that would be kind of in that in that mindset of a you know of a guy. When, when saying that, oh yeah, go ahead and play um, play man manager over there, you know. Go ahead and play boss. Yeah, go ahead and play boss. That that's, you know, and this is how a mindset of a Hopi is: is that they they think that if women are in in, in charge with something, then they don't get fussy or they don't get um, yelly at anybody uh, in in a in a such a huge tone that way. So, I guess that's how how mind Hopi minds think. And you know, I I think that. Sometimes I think that, you know, we have we have certain types of thoughts and sometimes we think that our thoughts are solely based on facts or yeah. reality or yeah. truths. But I think that, you know, sometimes we don't realize that our opinions or our thoughts might solely be based based on things like pride or solely based on the ego ego. Yeah, because, you know, we don't want to let certain Parts of our factory settings go. Yeah. Like, 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 like for me, cause I think about it with the Res Famous Wife all the time, because, you know, I, I tend to lean on this cultural belief that the woman is supposed to serve the men. Yeah. Because that's what you hear from the old people. Yeah. And, you know, and then we've talked about that in our past episodes that women do, or at least the older generation still serve those roles to where they're still serving their men. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I tend to lean on that with the Red's famous wife. And when I lean on her like that, she moves away real quickly. And then I fall on my face because, you know, she's not having it. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I'm starting to realize that I can cook my own dinner sometimes. Yeah. I'm starting to realize that I can clean the house on my own sometimes. And, and so, you know, if I'm starting to realize that, then why aren't we realizing that on the larger scale, like the Hopi Tribal Council, for example, because that's something that we discussed before was that it's this idea, this Hopi cultural idea that women don't belong there. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, I, then I, I also think too sometimes that, you know, at, at some point you do draw the line because then no matter how progressive any village gets, I don't think that we would ever see a woman give uh, among me. No. Give a chief. No. At any point in time. No. You know, like back in the back in the day, I guess you could say, 
you know, girls were brought up to become wives. You know, they were taught at, at such an early age to cook, to clean, to make biki, to make food, to make, uh, you know, to take care of of the, you know, take, take care of children, take care of the household. And back then, that's all that they were made for. And that's the reason why you have the women's society, because they kind of got tired of it. They kind of got that say that how come men have their own way of doing things? How come we women don't have uh, can't be like a man? So that's the reason why the women's society exists today. You know, the Mojau, you know, in that in that kind of context in Hopi tradition or in Hopi culture. And so like when you think about it, yeah, even though it is a matrilineal society that we do live in, we still have that way, that old mentality of 1950s, where it's like uh, the men go out to bring the, the bread and the butter, you know, they, they go out to make the bacon. And women are are here just making uh, babies and barefoot. What was what is the saying? Barefoot, naked, and making babies, or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> barefoot and barefoot and uh, ba- the, the term is barefoot and pregnant. Barefoot and pregnant. And, there you and go. And so while while some yeah. of you start uh, writing your complaints about Carl, <laughs> and you know because I, I I guess really you know and and we we kind of broadly covered this in prior episodes, but I guess really to to think about it, you know what I mean? Like I. I think that there's this, all this also this discussion of, of privilege, right? Yeah. Like like male privilege. And, you know, I think that that's kind of something that women, I guess, kind of have to con- contend with that when you're out there trying to garner the respect of your colleagues, that women aren't taken as seriously as men. And so you see it in the movies sometimes that, you know, somebody walks in through the door, they see a woman standing in front of them. They say, I, I'm here to see the person in charge. Yeah. And then it turns out that it's actually the woman that's in charge. But then yet, you know, the person thinks it's a joke. It's, like, no, I'm really here to see the person in charge. Talk to the man of the house pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you like, like what I said, the 1950s kind of ordeal, the, the thinking around there. And, you know, I do live with So and Kwa and they, So still has that mentality of that old world thinking or that real Hopi way of thinking where she was pretty much brought up in that context of like, I should serve my men or I should serve the men of the house pretty much. And it, it puts you in perspective. It's like, you know, the 21st century where a lot of these younger girls are younger brides that don't have that mentality of like, oh, okay, um, I should serve my man or I should serve as a Hopi woman. And, and that, that kind of puts you in that weird sense that, okay, then how, you know, a, a lot of it is because of media. It, it's the media that revolves around it. it is, it's basically like, I guess you could say brainwashing us in, in a way where we're becoming assimilated to Western society. And as that little snippet of uh, Carl's little podcast snuck in there, right there, right? I kind of spaced out a little bit. But, <laughs> but I guess really, you know, it, it's interesting to think about this and to think about, I guess, the realities of, of the reservation. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like, how does this play on reservation, especially particularly here on the Hopi Reservation? Because we've mentioned that a lot of these programs and organizations out here already have women leaders. Yeah. And having those women leaders in place... Is that, and you would imagine that that's some sort of support system for the younger generation of women leaders, right? Yeah. That, you know, that, that shows the girls that are in school today that it's possible for them to be an executive director of a nonprofit organization or to be a program manager of a program within our Hopi tribe. Yeah. But then when you think about our tribal council, has there ever been a woman chairman? No. Has there ever been a woman vice chairman? No. And what does that communicate? Does that mean that the tribal council is this good old boys club to where, I guess, I guess and you said it before, a he-man woman haters Yeah, the club. he-man woman haters club. You know, there was a discussion, one of the teachers here on the reservation, uh, I believe that he's a fourth grade teacher, or uh, I believe something like that. And he was telling me that in his in his class, uh, they were they were talking about like what they wanted to be when they grew up. Like, you know, the boys wanted to be, of course, uh, cops or like um, 
like firemen and, and stuff like that. And one girl, she said that I want to be the chairman of the Hopi tribe. And immediately his mind went, he's like, no, you can't. Really? <laughs> it's like, it's because of the way that we think. It's because of the way that, so, you know, history tells us that there has never been a woman in charge of the Hopi tribe before. So he didn't, he didn't know how to tell her that you can't run, but he just kind of encouraged her to believe in something else pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can't be the chairman of the Hopi tribe, but you know, why don't you think about uh, becoming the head cheerleader of uh, <laughs> when, once he gets to high school? Yeah. And it's weird because of the way that how Hopi minds think, and that, of course, we want to encourage all of our youngsters that we want to encourage all of the the girls that that they can become something bigger other than just a housewife, you know, leave it to beaver kind of style. And when when you think about it is that we live in a society that still has that mindset of the 1950s. We just have not jumped, uh, you know, have not assimilated to Western society. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, and so like you know, the, the the it kind of it kind of made me think when he was actually talking about this is that wow, it's like how do you tell a young girl that she can't become a leader of of the Hopi tribe? She, you can't become anything like that. You know, you can't you can't think about that kind of thing like that. It's like it's like saying I want to be um, I want to be a, a Kiva chief. You know, when you're a young girl. <laughs> or like, I want to be a soyal mongui, you know, and you, you tell her, no, that's only for men, uh -huh. you know, and, and though, I guess it's because of the traditions that we hold is that the traditional part is that geek mongui is only held by a higher uh, clanship and is held by the men pretty much. And each society, each men's society is held by the same same ordeal as well, too, where men have that same power as the Kikmongui does. So it is, I guess it does have that mentality that women should be in the house and men should be uh, leading the people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is that we as Hopi society just don't really un fully understand that this is the 21st century. This is something that we, we kind of have to break out of talking about like history in a way that history holds a lot of sentimental value to us. And there are different oppositions to how history has treated us. But then when you really think about it is that, we are trying to move forward in a way and that how Hopi do we still want to be in that in that general context of women versus men? Have you ever had a male supervisor before? Mm, yeah, when I was at Hastings. Yeah. And you've had a, a female supervisor. I've before? had a female supervisor. Yeah. Well, what would you say the differences between those two leadership styles are? Well, first of all, the man will let you have an extra 30 minutes of break time. <laughs> and the woman wants you to get back to work right away. <laughs> you know, I... I, I I, I, th I think that because because I've, I've had both too. Yeah, I, I, I've yeah. had both. And I, I'm, I guess what really I'm trying to get at is that if we allowed women to be in these positions of leadership that they've never been before here on the reservation. Yeah. What would change? Like, like, like how would things progress or not progress? Like, what would the differences be? Because then I, I think that, you know, in, in, in having male supervisors, I, I feel like that more of them are a little bit more direct. You yeah. Know what I mean, in terms of how they communicate with you. But then I, I do think that, you know, as having male supervisors that sometimes, you know, some of them do kind of dick around a little. Oh, bit. yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So it, there's a little bit room for 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 that sort of thing. But on, on the female side I, I really feel like that the women leaders tend to think a little bit more about certain things yeah and, and so I guess really there's more conversation around building programs or building try, trying to accomplish what it is that the reason why you're there to, to, to do something 
And um, and then when you think about like disciplinary actions, right? Like, have you ever been disciplined by your male supervisor? Oh, no. Have you ever been disciplined by the female oh, yes. supervisor? And, and what, what were those differences? Well, the reason why, um, when I had my the, the male guy in Hastings before, I dressed up as a, as a Native American uh, during our, our Halloween Halloween outfit. And um, I got in trouble for dressing up as a Native American you know, a Native American guy dressing up as a typical Native American guy, you know, this. Uh, and then another Native American guy told me that um, he said that, why are you dressing that way? That's inappropriate. He's like, but I'm Native American. I, I think I can do that. And, you know, my my boss guy is like, you know, hey, yeah, you can do it. You know, I don't really care. And I did the same thing as well, too, the following year when I had a, a female supervisor. She said that, no, I don't think that you should be doing that because that is very inappropriate to all of our customers here. And so she gave me the talk and stuff like that. I got a pink slip and, you know. I'm glad finally somebody slapped you around. <laughs> so if it's the man, I thank you for that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, because I, well, the the. the most of the male supervisors I've had were in the kitchen. Yeah. And so if there's any type of disciplinary action, and I've iterated this many times that the kitchen working dynamic is much different than working in the office. Yeah. Like, you know, there's a y lot of yelling. Yeah. There's a lot of cussing. Yeah. There's a lot of language in the kitchen that's very, that would land you in HR in most places. Yeah. And so to get a disciplinary reprimand from one of the head chefs, like, like they literally ripped you a new asshole with, yeah. with, with their words and then going and then working in the offices and then, you know, maybe getting a reprimand from a female supervisor. It wasn't as bad, but I guess really that's kind of a unique situation for me because I've never had a male supervisor outside of the kitchen. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I guess really, really, you know, and I don't want to stereotypical stereotype women leadership characteristics, but from my perspective, that's what it seemed like. It, see, I guess it really is almost similar to your parents, right? Like mm -hmm. how your mother handles you yeah. versus how your father handles you. You get in trouble, the mom might snap at you, but yet there's still some sort of comfort. At least was my experience. Well, I never had real parents to tell me that otherwise. So yeah, yeah, it was always just through so and qua. Mm -hmm. You know, qua will say that I'm going over to Peaky House because I don't want to hear so nagging at me 24 seven. And I understand now. I do understand that now. And then when the father gets upset with you, then it, it there's there's really it's just 100 percent tough love. <laughs> Pretty much, there, there, yeah. There's no hugging. <laughs> there's no. I'm sorry, I had to get after you. It's just <laughs> you, know, you get your butt whipped. And and so you know, I, I I think that that could be it. But then I guess really, you know, because because I think that, and you've said this before, that as males, you know, we kind of have the certain perspective yeah. on women, yeah, and where they belong. And no matter what, we always think that. But one of the things that we do as people is that we don't really tend to think about what people go through to get to where it is that they're trying to get to. So like when you think about women and the journeys that they have to make to get into a leadership position, what kind of discrimination do they go through? What type of sexist ordeals do they have to go through? What other types of issues do they have to go through? Because then, you know, like this is com completely stereotypical and it's it's probably something that's coming out of my out of my goodie. But, you know, I, I do tend to see women be a little bit more confrontational and adversarial with each other. Yeah. And I don't know if that's similar to a crab in the bucket type of mentality with how us poor quote unquote poor people are with one another. But I didn't, I do tend to see things like that. You know, before we move on, we're going to go ahead and take a quick break for our paid sponsors. Hey, you all, this is Carl from Carl and J man save the world podcast. This section here is dedicated to Debbie Tiwa. Congratulations to her because she has won the 2021 American Indian science and engineering society professional award for indigenous excellence. Debbie was recognized for her contributions to the solar industry over the past 30 plus years through training solar installers. She has been educating students and families while providing off-grid solar power to indigenous families. Asquali Gwakwa Agehe Debbie Tiwa for all that you do from the Native Renewables crew. 
Native Renewables is a nonprofit organization with Hopi and Navajo staff working to empower their communities with independence and power from the sun. Koen Viomala PLLC is 100% native owned and operated, founded by Vern Koen Viomala. Their practice areas include corporate law, business transactions, finance, economic development, gaming, casino development, online gaming, real estate, environmental permitting and approvals, telecommunications, government affairs, employment and labor relations, historic preservation and cultural resources, and energy. Koen Viomala is committed to making positive and lasting change in our communities as they support nonprofit volunteering. Community activism and employing Indian preference in hiring and vendor relations. Nurturing Indigenous Intelligence is a grassroots organization based on the Hopi Reservation. They work to alleviate the hardships in the community through acts of giving, from distributing school supplies, volunteering at various places, and working to expand their services. Follow them on Instagram at Nurturing I Squared and on Facebook at NI Squared Team to find out more. Terraform Development is a Navajo and Hopi-owned engineering, architectural, and project management firm located in northern Arizona. The company has full-time staff and comprises of Navajo and Hopi employees. Terraform services include civil engineering, residential design, drone mapping, and project management on projects for your need. Terraform is a Priority One Navajo Certified Business and Hopi Business License Certified. Contact Terraform Development at T-E-R-R-A the number 4orm.com and follow them on Instagram at Terraform Development. All right. I think it's time for us to bring our special guest in. So uh, welcome everybody, Lillian Hill. Great. Thank you so much. It's really great to join you today. So um, so I uh, am Hopi and also um, Kwetlan from my dad's side. I'm Pipunwa and I come from the uh, village of Tikotsmovi. Um, I am a mother and also um, a community organizer and I live and work uh, within um, my community in Hopi. I've lived there and worked there for um, decades now and I have been the founder and executive director of the Hopi Dutsua Permaculture Institute for the past uh, I'd say five years, six years or so, and then I recently accepted a new position as the new executive director of the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, um, as well as have been very busy um, working towards obtaining my uh, master's degree at NAU in sustainable communities. Wow, that is very, very extensive. I mean, like, uh, I went to uh, a refrigeration school and uh I had to print out my own uh, certificate of completion. So he, he, he printed out his own certificate of completion <laughs> and then the school collapsed right after that. That's, but, oh, wow. that, that's really interesting though, Lillian, can you share a little bit more about the programs, about the new program that you just got accepted into and then also the permaculture program? Sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll start with the permaculture program. So, Really, um, you know, the, the Hopi Tuskwa Permaculture Institute is a nonprofit organization that's based uh, out in Hopi. And, um, you know, it's really uh, evolved from creating specific programming for youth ages 12 through 18. Um, really began this summer programming and really bringing young people from our communities together with farmers and also Hopi artists and craftspeople and folks who um, continue to you know, to practice land stewardship um, practices at home. And so we really felt that it was important to engage young people um, and, you know, older um, folks or even elders in a process of intergenerational, um, you know, exchange. And that grew more into, you know, developing a nonprofit organization that created programming and, you know, various avenues for um, apprenticeship and training and home ownership and, um, We've also been instrumental in partnering to establish the Hopi Farmers Market and the Hopi Food Co-op, as well as Hopi um, Community Supported Ag Projects as well. So, um, so it really evolved, and you can find out more information at www.hopi.org. <clears throat> and um, the new organization that I'm uh, going to be uh, you know, involved with in my new work is, is really focused on the broad work of, uh, of really supporting the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Movement, which is a movement of um, 
of folks from our tribal communities who are really involved in restoring or revitalizing um, traditional um, food systems. So that work is, is, is more broad and focuses largely on, you know, on a national basis. Wow. That's great. Thank you for sharing that, Lillian. And that, that's pretty, those, that, that's some really great programs that you're involved with, because I think that, you know, Hopi traditionally, that food sovereignty is kind of like the, the basis of, of what Hopi life is. And so if you have any internship programs, I'd like to enroll Carl into one of those just so he can get back, uh, get, get his feet back in the fields. <laughs> Actually, um, Lillian and her husband, Hokobo, uh, were very great friends with each other. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, so we're, we're very close friends, J-Man. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we, we've been out to, actually, actually, we've been out to Carl's family's field. So I've seen Carl in action oh, several really? times. So, so it's like, yeah, so, so I've seen him. So you actually did see him sitting underneath the, the corn stalk, drinking up the water supply. There. <laughs> yep, I've seen him doing that, plus carrying the you know, wheelbarrows Lillian, of corn. So. Lillian, you're not supposed to uh, divulge any secrets like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, uh, Lillian, I, I think that, you know, in, in previous um podcast episodes and then you know, based upon our conversation earlier, that I guess really, you know, when you think about like, women in leadership positions on the national level, that there tends to be a disparity between women serving in these leadership roles. And then, you know, I, I'm so glad that you're here to share with us your experiences, but in your journey, getting into the positions that you've held as, as the, these executive director positions, can you share what type of difficulties you encountered uh, being, being a woman trying to move up the ladder? Yeah, I think, um, you know, for, for myself at a, at a kind of a younger age, like when I first, um, you know, went into an undergrad program, you know, I think the program that I was involved in, the Applied Indigenous Studies program at NAU was really, you know, focused on cultivating Indigenous leadership. And so uh, many of the, um, you know, faculty and also directors of that program were women. They were Native women from different tribal communities and so I was lucky uh, in that I was you know involved in the program where there were you know significant uh, mentors that helped me and to help guide my overall understanding of you know tribal tribal nation building and also you know those folks and mentors really helped me to begin to I guess carve out my own pathway and how you know I uh, could serve as I wouldn't have considered myself a leader at that time, but, but how I could carve out an idea and even a plan for um, for my trajectory, um, my life path and my trajectory, and that includes career as well. And so I think um, also I became involved in like political activism around the Black Mesa issues of coal mining and water depletion. And really, um, I would say, began uh, my own process in, in establishing like projects and different grassroots organizing work that was outside of the normal structures of nonprofits or tribal, you know, government um, programming. So I think my, my journey was a little different in that I didn't graduate and go right into the workforce. I was really very much interested in learning how to uh, navigate and create projects and um, be involved in work that was a little outside of those structures initially. And then it wasn't until recently that I became, you know, involved in developing nonprofit structures or being involved on boards or, you know, really being um, involved in that work, partnering with tribal programs and other things. So, um, and, and once, you know, I became more involved in those structures and for the executive director, I saw myself in developing nonprofit structures and became, you know, <clears throat> um, and, and entered a position of, of being a boss or, or a director um, bringing staff on and working with, um, you know, folks in the community that I realized that we do face women face significant challenges in terms of navigating and, and kind of understanding, um, you know, certain behaviors like misogyny or chauvinistic behaviors towards women who are in, you know, positions of power. And so, you know, th th those have been, I face those challenges, but I think overall, 
um, some of the challenges that I faced are really connecting and having, you know, relationships with um, with mentors at home who are willing to guide and mentor through, you know, this this process or through the sector of, of nonprofit growth and um, and development. Wow. So has anybody, has anybody challenged you during your time uh, with this nonprofit organizations? Has anybody said anything to you in a, in, in a negative way? Well, I mean, I think as far as, you know, I've had many, many experiences in the work that I, that I've been involved with working with young people and young adults and even adults and contractors. And I think that, um, you know, I have had negative experiences with Hopi men in general who, who find it, um, you know, a little, who have gotten offended by me, you know, um, either making recommendations or having to, um, you know, even in some cases, um, you know, exert like disciplinary um, actions and things like that. So, so yeah, I've definitely been either directly challenged or even indirectly challenged. Yeah. I, I think that that's a pretty good um, piece of information to share because, you know, I, I think that, you know, when we talk about some of these disparities, well, at, at least, you know, with our podcast, you know, there's kind of some some more um, issues, I guess, that are kind of thrown under the rug. And then, Carl, if you recall, we kind of had this conversation very recently. And Lillian, I, I, I'm sure that you've experienced it. And I know that a lot of women in the workforce probably experienced this, is that at one point, Carl and I, we had this conversation about uh, the topic of uh, creepy men, I guess. Oh, yeah. And, and you know, we, we because I, I think that, you know, we've talked about it at a, a large extent that here on the reservation, you know, we've, we've introduced this idea of factory settings and the fact that, you know, our Hopi culture, that there is this, um, I guess, aspect of flirting involved when it involves, you know, like your your clanship, your your cultural maze, I guess, your nephews and, and aunties. And so that was kind of the joke that Carl and I kind of developed was Hopis are the originators of the uncle and auntie dynamic. But I guess as a woman, especially within the Hopi communities, I, I guess I can imagine and you can reaffirm it that women do have to deal with other males and I guess kind of creating a line to where certain types of interactions with your male counterparts are appropriate and what's not appropriate is it, would that be a pretty good, uh, I, I guess, uh, hypothesis? Yeah. I mean, definitely. I think our, you know, community, you know, in here in Hopi, we do have cultural norms and, you know, kinship relations that are in place that are, you know, I think outside of the scope of Bahana or Western um, understanding, you know, we have different teachings and different ways that we've developed that help us to maintain, you know, relationships and um, and balance, I think. And so I think from a cultural perspective, you know, I was raised, you know, in that culture and knowing how to perhaps relate to, you know, my clan relatives. And I think that's, you know, definitely formative in uh, in Hopi's approach to, you know, to continuing our culture. But I think we also associate in a different world too. You know, we associate um, in a, in a reality where, um, you know, we've been impacted by colonization and, and Western ideas and approaches to, um, to life as well. So I think, um, you know, and, and within our own community and within, I think the larger paradigm of, um, you know, that exists within tribal communities, you know, women face, um, you know, issues that are, that are related to, you know, sexual abuse and harassment or, or even, um, you know, even, even more serious crimes. Um, so women are definitely targeted at a larger, you know, from a larger perspective. And I think that, you know, as a woman, I've definitely been in situations both professionally and personally where, you know, men have um, either brought teasing forth that is that is you know I think culturally appropriate depending on relationship you know clan relations. But then I've also been in situations where men who are not you know who don't have those relationships to me have tried to cross the line or, or who have you know definitely bordered on on sexual harassment, which I take very seriously. So 
you know, I think I think we have definite issues in Hopi that are related to power dynamics of how men feel, you know, or how, how this philosophy perhaps or these ideas that women, you know, shouldn't be involved in political leadership and how that is internalized and, and can be translated into like sexual harassment or even violence towards women. Yeah, that is actually true. So, so I just want to say to all the men out there that's listening to this, especially if you're here on the reservation, don't be creepy. <laughs> yeah, don't be yeah, creepy. Don't Carl, be creepy. don't be creepy. I'm never creepy. <laughs> I, I don't know, man. The conversation that you and I had, I I think you're borderline creepy. That's not borderline creepy. That's just being a Hopi male. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. The, and, and, you know, I think I even, I even think that needs to be challenged a little bit, both not only from women, but from men as well. Hopi men is really to understand, you know, how, you know, how different ideals have been internalized and how that, that can be seen or, or how those, you know, different, um, I, I think cultural norms can be harmful too, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I, I think that definitely this needs to be talked about because, and like I said before, in one of our previous episodes that I really had, like, I was really oblivious to the links that some men go to, to, I guess, reach out to women, like unsolicited pictures of areas and, you know, the type of conversations or the type of um, catch lines that they try to use to get women's attention. But Lillian, I know that you're, you're on limited time and I definitely wanted to get your opinions on this. And you mentioned it a little bit about um, this idea of women not belonging in the political arena from a Hopi perspective. And because then, you know, you, you mentioned it with your experience at the universities, and this is an experience that I shared before that for the most part, you think about all of our big nonprofit nonprofits out here on Hopi, a majority of them are women led. And if women are already in these leadership positions, then why aren't we seeing them in our Hopi tribal council? Yeah, I think statistically, if you, you know, look at um, <clears throat> some of the research that's been brought forth, like, for instance, through like the Harvard Project on Indigenous, you know, nation building and government, you know, statistically throughout Indian country and in the United States, um, you know, tribal leaders or even tribal chairmen or presidents are statistically over 55, exclusively male, have are have either served in the military or are veterans and are either conservative or, uh, you know, more Republican leaning. And so if you look at the, that statistically nationally, I think that reflects, you know, this historical, you know, colonization and this, these historical issues that have infiltrated our, our communities, I think, since you know, Spanish conquest and then European colonization. So, you know, I think those issues have definitely infiltrated the, the tribal decision-making process as well as the culture of how women are, 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 uh, are involved or how women are excluded, you know, in leadership matters. And so I think, you know, there's no direct pathway uh, to leadership for Hopi women or for Native women in general in, in many tribal communities. So, you know, a lot of um, Hopi women come to, you know, their positions through their own personal journey or through their, you know, cultural, educational, professional, or, you know, relational experiences. So I think, you know, the opportunities that are offered on the res- on our reservation communities are a bit different from those that are found perhaps in the urban environment. And so, um, you know, I think those, those pathway models for women-centered leadership are important to develop, but I think there's, you know, also a number of barriers to that success of, of women as leaders, and one of them, you know, perhaps uh, is discrimination, you know, looking at how women are discriminated against or how the perception of women in leadership from a Hopi context um, can be considered discriminatory. Also, you know, lack of perhaps financial resources or support from families who are who are firmly embedded in that idea that women shouldn't receive an education and therefore are, are, you know, um, conditioned to be more, I guess, you know, um, focused on. And so we'd like to thank Lillian for joining us and then sharing her, uh, her story and sharing her opinions about, you know, the place of women lead women here on the Hopi reservation. And so, you know, we'd like to uh, thank you all for joining us here today. Yeah. Um, unfortunately she kind of got cut off early and we couldn't get her last words. And so it's just 
minor uh, technical. Somebody should probably call the Hopi Internet Company. <laughs> I didn't pay it this this month, so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, Ho- you know, Ho- Hopi Reservations, a place where even if you do pay your bills, that doesn't solve all the. They shut answers. it off anyway. <laughs> But anyway, thank you for listening to this uh, brand new episode of the Carl and J-Man Save the World podcast. You know, it, it's e- episode one of us being back together. <laughs> episode one but of us. Y- was- you know what they say, though? They say that once you break up, that it's easier to keep breaking up again. So yeah. I might just pick a fight with you just so I can just keep so the can five star keep- podcast going. Y- you know what? That's that's fine with me. So as long as I don't have to see your face anymore. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, it is great to be back in the studio with this uh this guy here, so. With your best friend. With my best friend, of course. And so if you are listening to this on Anchor website and if you want to become our 30 pack uh contributor, go ahead and go donate. It's only for $1.99 or 4.99, something like that. And you know, you get a special shout out. We get to keep our our podcast going. If you want to just donate a dollar or more, go to buymeacoffee.com slash CJ podcast to donate one dollar or more. And if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to give us a five star review. I don't know if you noticed, but somebody somebody out there gave us a one star review. That was me. So whoever is out there, <laughs> you're probably listening to Carl's uh, solo episode. That, that was me because I just hated you at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> but don't you forget to give us a five-star review that really helps us out. And then if you're uh, listening to this on YouTube, don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button. You can find us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Carl and J man. And uh, I, I think that's it. Thank you for listening to Carl and J man save the world podcast. My name is Carl and this is my best friend, Jamie. So long. Good luck. Hi, this is Carl from Carl and J-Man Save the World podcast. If you have listened to this episode, I'm sorry that we had to cut our guests short. Living on the Hopi Reservation has its quarrels and its its quirks, uh, and we can't control the technology that is out here. So hopefully we can bring our special guest back into the studio so we can have a perfect conversation with Carl and J-Man and our special guest.